dear learners so once again welcome today's new i mean session it's a new course is a mso4 okay so your counselor is dr subrat kumar rat so he is a very i mean nice academician he is very strong in i mean his subject so i mean uh, dear learners now i had changed with the schedule so please everybody put in the mute mode samaste mute mode re apan mic ku rakhandu so that is audible to everybody and whoever want to ask the question then you can ask your question unmute your mic so i had sent the schedule new schedule in your whatsapp group so you had change our schedule everybody got the schedule have you checked in your whatsapp group so you will update in our website also so apan manakar mso 4 thila 7 ru 14 parjanta ta par ame mso 3 start karuthulu 15 ru 22 pondo now i had seen because you demanded santosh sath will take the class so santosh sath sir will take the class of mso 3 okay so now what i had done today mso 4 then tomorrow mso 3 class will start so in alternative day so i had sent the schedule to all of you so i mean like seventh is mso 4 then eighth is mso 3 like this i mean you check out the schedule i had given in the whatsapp group okay so according to that you join i mean i mean link is same okay and anybody wants to join second year class for the second year class also i had given the link to you in your whatsapp group so i mean last time after completion of mso e1 you are unable to join mso e2 class whoever is interested to join that class now i rectified that because that mistake is in my in, in my side only that is rectified whatever the mso e1 link that will continue in mso e3 and e4 so if anybody want to join then you may join in that class also so for the mso 4 class i mean the uh, regarding indian society so sir will take today the first block i mean block 1 so whatever the situation due to the pandemic so you are staying home now the shutdown is again started the june month is very critical so it is a very critical juncture now so i request all of you please stay safe and stay home so don't come out outside so take care of your health so due to this i mean google meet it is possible to i mean pass on knowledge and i mean the interaction will happen with this google meet nowadays the face to face interaction is not possible because of to july 31st our study center is closed down so whatever the reason whatever your doubt whatever the clarification now with the grievance cell you are i mean you are down from 12 to 1 if anybody have any doubts any query you can join on that also for the 12 to 1 program so the online counseling session for the first year it will continue up to 23 21st there is no counseling session so june 21st there is no counseling so one day break i had given so please kindly student go through with the new schedule given into your i mean whatsapp group so according to that you have to join for every day session the session will continue 10 to 12 but only 3 4 3 4 alternative is there so not a issue i mean for for your demand we requested you i mean you accept your demand jo santosh rat i mean will will take your class of mso3 so with these words i once again i welcome dr rat so dr rat i had handed over the session to you so you start your presentation welcome uh, to dr rat uh, thank you sir hello good morning everybody i am previous day now to teach you on ms004 sociology in india just a, just a minute student sir voice is audible to all of you yes sir okay, yes sir good. yes sir okay thank you so i am very much thankful to dr santosh kumar panigrai for giving me a chance to present myself before you so today we will start to understand the emergence of sociology in india prior to that we you must have read about the origin of western origin of sociology which usually a product of western enlightenment d 
during 14th to 18th century and in the year 1839 the term sociology was coined by the founding father august comte so what we have learned or you have known about previously is that it studies the human relation in its historical context and makes generalization out of it so what sociology is actually it refers to the study of society that means it's a global you know, a global subject that studies societies across the globe so what you need to keep in mind that we basically or the sociologists basically take into account the ideas and the ideals values and the aspirations problems and the predicaments of what of the society they are studying or they used to study so the same situation also happens with our indian society though you have to keep in mind that it is an impact of the western culture or western study scenario or western enlightenment that impacted this indian thinkers to think about indian society accordingly so what the western enlightenment is all about it refers to basically the scientific technological industrial and commercial development that took place in european countries again to counter that uh, to, to, to uh, again there is another concept that is french revolution french revolution that took place in the year 1739 which questioned the very authority of church and monarchy so the thinking process with the evolution of human society changes so people started thinking rationally that means they were no more accepting the authority of the church guided by the monarchs because science industrial uh, science and the thinking process logical thinking process that refers to philosophical root in it influenced them a lot so they bracket each and everything they had in their mind earlier and question them accordingly when they feel uncomfortable with that so as a situation what happens there was a sense of talking about reading society in such a manner that it can be scientific as well as social in nature that's why we call sociology as a social science because your scientific investigation happens only in natural sciences like physics chemistry mathematics etc but what happens to the society yes we can study them scientifically then how can we study we can comparatively study them we can take them into consideration by a logical come by coming to the logical conclusions all the things that means a proper dialogical relation a proper skepticism all those things needs to be understood in the light of the above mentioned revolutions a new discourse developed and that new discourse helped the, the society or helped the thinkers to think society more scientifically than ever so to say sociology as a discipline is a product of western intellectual discourse so what before going to the emergence of sociology in india let's have something in mind can anybody anybody of you tell that we don't have any thinking process about society earlier that's not because there are so many texts if you will go through them there are, are so many texts which talk about the society 
the indian scenario for example some text will talk about the dharmas dharma uh, some text will talk about dharma some will talk about the economy some will talk about the political system so it's true that not a single science is there which teach them as a together or as a whole so the sociology as a separate academic discipline in indian universities to in the past century of the 20th century uh, 20th uh, in the past half of the 20th century prior to that if we will go through them we can find that it develops in various stages we will go to the stages later on first we try to understand what the debate is all about regarding the emergence of sociology in india i have already told you sociology is of western origin so whether the indian are able to accept them or are interrogating them so the debate is like this there are various schools of thoughts regarding so uh, regarding discussion about uh, discussing about the sociology in india the first school of thought believes that indian <coughs> society basically talks about the ideas that we find in various ancient scriptures or we talk about metaphysics metaphysics and ethics so they give and uh, they give a textual interpretation of the indian society for them the indian from the very early beginning of the society started thinking in a philosophical and critical manner but there is another school of thought that counters this they believe that indian philosophy with school of critical and independent thought subra sir yes sir just a minute students kindly write your enroll number and name in the chat box continue sir yes thank you so what the other school of thought is arguing they are arguing the textual interpretation of the indian society is not at, a, at all acceptable because with the change of society with the change of time and space society also changes so those ancient scriptures are no more suitable for understanding the present society hence what we have told you here we have told i have told you that there are two schools of thought one supports the indological as, uh, textual aspects that means those who support the ancient scriptures and the other school is something different that interrogates them that's why they are always of course a contradiction between sociology in india or sociology for india let's discuss the above debate to understand the emergent sociolo uh, sociology in india so to understand it more specifically let's take two issues into consideration first one is that social background of the emergence of sociology second one is issues and themes of analysis your unit 1 deals with social background of uh, the emergence of sociology that talks about the historical root of social uh, societal thinking the other or the second unit deals with the issues and themes of analysis in indian sociological writings but prior to that keep in mind that in india sociology and anthropology 
were started equally or are studied equally. There were no different departments or different school of thought at the earliest. So, what till our discussion ends, we will take together both anthropology and sociology as a whole to understand the Indian society. So, the whole, first we will discuss about the social background of the emergence of sociology. To understand that, if we will go through the historical background, we can divide the whole system of evolution of sociology into three phases. The first phase is in between 1773 to 1900. And the second phase is in between 1900 to 1950. And the third phase is in between 1950 until it continues. So, social historical background we will start with. First, we have to categorize the socio historical background of Indian way of thinking. I have categorized, and it is also mentioned in the book, that the whole sociological thought can be categorized into three types. First one will be the ancient view. Second one will be the Britishers view. And the third one will deal about the contemporary or up in independent India or after independence of India. So let's begin with the ancient view. As I have already told you, we cannot completely deny that there were no such thinking about society prior to sociology in India. Yes, there is thinking and those thinking are specific in nature. For example, Manuj Dharma Shastra. In Manuj Code of Conduct, he discussed or he had written about our way of doing. According to our doing, we find our result or we deserve our result. This talks about a certain type of ideal type or ideology that prevails in the society. At the same time, there is another concept called, there is another thinker who is known for his analysis of orthosastra or economics. He is Kautilya. He had given an elaborate explanation of how to do economy or how economy is sorry how economy is influencing the society and how at the same time society influences the economy at a, as a whole according to him society and in economy both are interlinked so there is another thinker who is called as Charpak. He is more known as a philosopher. He talks about society in a skeptical manner. That means he didn't accept anything very easily. He accepted everything through discussion. So he was very much skeptical about the prevailing societal norms, rules, and regulations. So what he usually talked about, he usually talked about not accepting the society as it is, but if you are, if you are finding any problem in it, then just try to question it. That means it is quite philosophical in nature. And what we accept in social sciences as the rational view. That means don't accept anything as it is, rather through discussion come to the conclusion. Some will support that and some will interpret that. 
after proper discussion a complete conclusion will come and that is rational that will be accepted by everybody that means from the above discussion what you have known you have come to know that indian way of thinking is very much enriched with social economic and philosophical thinking so to say we cannot completely deny that there were no such thinking about or of or for society so to say from the above analysis two points can be derived first one is relationship between social reality and social philosophy second one is relationship between freedom of choice and freedom of inquiry so to say though it is true that there is not a single subject that deals with all these three aspects yet thinking society differently in different manner was there so we cannot completely deny that there was no sense of social thinking in india we can say only there is no proper subject to deal with them as a whole that will on include all the above aspects are you getting my so to say the second phase i have told you first i will discuss about the answer then the second one is the arab person account previously i told you the british sorry for that the second point is the arab person account arab person account that means you have known it from the history that in various time various outsiders came to india for various purposes some have had come here for gaining some knowledge some want to do some sorts of business some want to rule over india so the first among the outsiders are the arab persons how can we know let's discuss about some of the writings of the outsiders from arab or pars that means iran first one of them is the is it megasthenes he was a greek ambassador to chandragupta maurya's dynasty he had written and observed the indian society very closely he classified indian society into seven classes but he was unable to take an account of the varna system as it was that means he completely ignored knowingly or unknowingly the varna aspect of indian class system second one is al biruni he took into account the varna system as it was prevalent in india to understand the caste hierarchy in indian society then came ibn batuta he explained the geographical socio cultural condition and the daily life of people of india that means previous to deals with the class system as it was in the as it was prevalent in indian society but ibn batuta moved a step forward to understand the geographical condition and tried to understand the socio cultural condition that varies from part uh, to part of india that means he took into consideration geography first then tried to relate it with the socio cultural conditions of indian society 
So he had somehow written a clear or he had somehow given a clear picture of the Indian society. Then come, then came Macro Polo. He studied the sociocultural settings of South India. You see the chronology. First Megasthenes, he studied the class system. Then came Alberuni, he studied the caste system based on Burnak. And then came Ivan Batuta, who studied the geographical condition that is related with the sociocultural condition. Then came here the uh, came here Macropolo. He studied a particular area that is South India. Just mark the points properly, what I am telling you. Because it is very much interesting to understand the origin of thinking or doing ethnographic studies. Hence, I am giving this in such a clear-cut manner. That's why I am telling you to keep in mind first Megasthenes, it is your class study, then Alberuni, it is your caste that is based on Varna system, then came Iban Batuta, who had studied Indian society more properly than the previous two, and then came Bakrapolo, who had studied Indian society, that is, to the South Indian context, not the proper or the whole Indian context. Then come Abul Faji, who is he or who was he? He had written Ain e Akbari. So according to Abul Faji, he had given a clear cut picture of the Indian social milieu. How and why? He had written all these things with extensive ethnographic studies or field work. I will deal with ethnographic studies later on. Just keep, in, keep it in mind that ethnography is also known as field work based on participant observation. So to say, Abul Faji helped Akbar in to rule over the whole Indian society by giving him details about the Indian social structure. So what are the main points of his writing? He wrote about borno based Hindu social system in plain areas and in best categories in hilly areas. That means it showed you that he had covered a wide portion of Indian society as his ethnographic part. That means he marked two things, keep it in mind. He marked Borna system was prevalent in plain area and kinship based system was prevalent in hilly areas. What is the difference? What is the plain area and what is the hilly area? You keep in mind the whole map of India. You will find the northeast part or the northern part is belong to the hilly person and plain areas then the other aspect, other states. So basically, basically Abul Faji did extensive field work in a comparative manner. He compared the plain areas with that of the hilly areas. And what you know you, you must have known that in hilly areas, basically, the primitive people used to live, which we call or which we term as Adivasis. So who are they? There are various types of tribes like Gond, Ahom, 
Santals and all those things. They, so Abul Faji took into account the comparative, uh, uh, took into account the social structure that is prevalent or that was prevalent in those two geographical places. He had divided the whole India into plain area and tribal land. And what he found? He found the plain areas were dominated by the Borno based caste hierarchy. At this, on the other hand, the hilly areas based on kinship based hierarchies. So, though it is not mentioned in the book, in this chapter, about what is kinship based hierarchy. Let's have some idea on it. Kinship basis, kinship refers to the relation based on blood and marriage. So you will, while you will study about the kinship relation in India, you will find that there are various types of families or societies which are classified on the basis of the blood relation or on the basis of, of relation that occurs from marriage. Basically, among the tribals, there were no concept of caste. Hence, he had mentioned who? Abul Faji. He had mentioned that the tribal society can be marked with kin based categories who will dominate, who will subordinate, who will own the property, who will be the head of family, all these things, and who will accept properties from which side, and what will happen to the society after getting married. All these come under the concept of kin based categories. And what's about the Borno based caste system? Is you will study about caste system in your second model. Still, I will reflect some of it. The whole Borno system divides the society into four categorization. Keep in mind that Borno is not equal to caste. While we will discuss about caste system, I will make it more clear. But keep in mind that Borna system divides the society into four categories. Then what is caste? As S.C. Dubai has mentioned, caste here refers to the subgroups within the Borna system. It is there in the book. You can, if you will go through the book properly, then you can find, otherwise I will make it clear in the next class where it is mentioned. So what I am telling is nothing different, but it is there in the book, but keep it in mind so that you can easily understand. So to say, all these Arab Persian accounts depicted or picture or picturized the Indian society in various manners. Some has deal with particular section, some have deal with the whole Indian society as it, as it is or it was and everything. So in the earlier section, we talked about the ancient. In the, in here, we talked about the Arab Persian account. Then in the next, we will take a, talk about the introduction of British rule, that is the third phase. Prior to the introduction of British rule, let's understand how was the Indian socio-cultural system during pre-British era? Because when I will talk about the introduction of British rule, it will make you sense to differentiate between pre-British India and British India. So first, 
let's discuss about the stable indian social cultural system as it was in the pre british india gopal haldar a noted marxist has rightly pointed that indian society is predominantly or was predominantly governed by the agrarian structure what is agrarian agrarian refers to the relation between people between community between society by taking into consideration agri uh, into consideration agriculture as a main part of it here agriculture does not simply mean that doing cultivation rather agriculture refers to land ownership also so what is what i have told you agrarian society refers to agro based art and crafts and the ag agro based social relation excuse me so to say in pre british india the first aspect that came to our mind was agrarian social structure or agriculture based social structure that specifically deals with the cultivation aspect land ownership and other aspects related to the culture like arts and crafts let's say give an example <clears throat> take into consideration about your own society if you are living in odisha you must have an idea about western odisha's boisakhi boisakhi we usually talk that nuakhi in western odisha specifically in sambalpur we talk about nuakhi what is that nuakhi is a function or a festival that deals with eating newly harvested your grains or we call it rice so when rice was when rice is harvested we celebrate the it by worshiping goddess samalai that means here you see we was prior to harvesting prior to cultivation we worship the land first for proper harvesting for for secure harvesting then after harvesting we again worship so what is that all our ritual practices related to the agriculture so nuwa khai is a part of the agrarian structure isn't it it was there it is there and it will be there so in pre british india in various states there were such type of agrarian structure then comes the second point that is caste what is caste as i have told you those are sub categories of the varna system that means we will talk about it later on but keep in mind for your purpose just keep in mind the caste system has divided the whole society into an hierarchy into a hierarchical order brahmins kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras they came under the varna category here and another type of caste is found that is called untouchables if you will go through the works of hesidube he had 
clearly mentioned that untouchables are also coming under the caste category. However, you will see a very interesting thing. We go caste is very very best, and though it create a hierarchical order in the society, yet the whole society is very much or was very much interlinked with each other. That means all caste based society. or all caste based communities were depending or were interlinked with each other which is clearly mentioned under hindu yajmani system what are the duties of the brahmins the brahmins supposed to teach and do priestly jobs what is the what is the duty of a kshatriya the duty of a kshatriya is to protect the land the monarch and family itself or to say to protect the society itself what is duty what is the duty of vaisya to agricultural services basically we call them farmers what was the duty or is the duty of the sutras they provide service and sc dube has also mentioned the first three categories that means brahmins kshatriyas and vaisyas came under the category of dija that means iceberg you must have most of you have seen that among brahmins and the karanas Uh, and the mahantis they are in a term called bratapanayana or sacred thread ceremony sacred thread ceremony is referred to as the sanskritic incarnation of a person or so to say this above three caste that is brahmins kshatriyas and vaisyas they come under the jo sutras and untouchables they were placed in a lower manner in the society but if you will go through the textual interpretation you will find don't i am not talking about the present situation i am talking about the textual just keep in mind because till now the britishers have not arrived after the britishers arrived there was a chance prior to that indian society is guided by the yajmani system yajmani system refers to the provision of service provided by a specific caste category to other caste category is that for example the duty of a brahmin is provide ritual service to other categories other caste categories just keep in mind by worshiping only can he or she or the family of a brahmin survive providing you need food clothing and shelter so be the duty of a brahmin then if he will only wash it if he will wash it in return for whom he rendered his service or he renders his service caste category specifically with specific job category will provide service to me for example i am a brahmin and i am going to a tanti tanti jhas what it means those who wear i provide them a ritual service and in return they provide with clothing so also with the vessels uh, i go to their house for ritual purpose i will 
do all the ritual activities in their house in return they will provide me with grants this is called the interlinkage between caste categories which is termed as the jajamani system we will be uh, we will make it clear in next section or next unit while discussing about uh, the uh, discussing about the caste system in india just keep it in mind what i have told then comes the idea of karma and rebirth what is that as i have already told you in the ancient scripture i have mentioned you about dharma shastra of manu he talked about the code of conduct or the karma what will you do so will you reap that means if you will do good karma then you will placed in the best category by the care by the god so idea of karma constraints us not doing anything harm to anybody it constraint us not to go against the society at all so to say the idea of karma very much control our society smart hence in pre british india we were very much guided by the dharma so to say the pre british indian social structure is very much not based on caste conflicts that does not mean that there were no caste conflict but as a whole we perceive it that people used to live in peace because of caste beds division of labor there were no race for competition as a result people became inactive or hardly they are mobile so gopal halda criticized caste system here by saying that the idea of karma and rebirth secured your social stability by discouraging you keep it in mind that will discourage you because you want question any other aspects or misdeed of any caste people that's why he mentioned that it discourages your social ability and individual intuition so till now we have an overall idea about the pre british indian social structure so let's have an analysis on the introduction of british rule in india are you able to hear me properly yes sir okay thank you whenever there will be a problem just remind me are you getting me properly what i am saying Fine. okay let's talk about the introduction of british rule prior to that just have an analysis of ar desai he is a renowned marxist thinker in india he criticized as well as praised the british system in india according to him and as you will find in other writings also the britishers introduced press railways western education what we call it modern education clubs and associations these are very much new concepts to 
our own society because their way of education is completely different from our way of education in pre british era what happened to us we usually educated according to the scriptures or vedic scriptures and we get education under gurukul system but after the advent of britishers they introduce school colleges etc earlier we used to hear and memorize about this society about philosophy about economy from our gurus and those who are well versed in sanskrit they were capable enough to understand the vedas however most of us were not educated in sanskrit hence we used to memorize the teachings of our gurus so shruti means we hear and smriti means we memorize these two were the basic aspect of our ancient teaching standard but with the advent of britishers modern or western education was introduced we will discuss it later just keep it in mind britishers as i have the sai has clearly pointed out britishers introduced your press railways for communication western education clubs and associations second he has also mentioned about that this those who were trained in british education they are errors and attachment with the british lifestyle that means those those who were educated in western way of education they were more inclined to the western way of thinking in comparison to those who were educated in indian standard so to say they are came for the first time and skeptical situation that means some will interrogate the indian way of thinking and who are they those who were educated in western way they look their own society in a very suspicious manner they they started complaining about any problems in the society for example i will give you some example let's have an idea about sati system in pre british era whatever may be the cause of sati but after the death of husband the wife supposed to uh, die in the pyre of her husband that is called sati but do you think sati is a good man don't the women have an option to life does their life simply confined to the husband how did i ask or how do i ask all these things because i am educated in the western way of thinking if i was educated in the indian way of thinking i would have argued something different i would have argued that previous society was very much intolerant because india suffered a lot by the outsiders so they treated the female indian female very heinous and as a result or to interrogate that or to counter that they are of course sati but 
as i am educated in western way of thinking i question that i will think the other way while the previous one talks about the maintenance of the structure i talked about the integration of the structure or i will counter that maintenance of the structure these two concepts are related with functionalism structural functionalism and critical theory structural functionalism previously prevalent in indian society and still you can also mark it that talks about system maintenance we ought to say whether it, that is good or bad for the society whether we will question how can we maintain the system properly for smooth functioning of the society so in uh, the structural functionalist on question sati whether it is good or bad whether they will find out or they will elaborate that sati pratha occur because during that so, uh, time the outsider ill treated the females hindu females that's why they protect themselves in that manner but critical or the marxist aspect of the thinking that came after the advent of the britishers talked about questioning that thing because the female has the right to life see we must not say that she is not empowered enough to protect herself these are the concept just keep in mind because in the next session when we will talk about the village study we will deal about various theories but here just keep in mind the themes why there are theories and how we will look at the society so now talk about the british system introduction of british system a little more okay just begin the british came into india portuguese to come into india as your history told you the britishers came in india for the purpose of doing business but in due course of time the purpose of doing business was very much replaced by the idea of ruling whatever may be why they study why they took interest in understanding the indian society very much try to analyze that just keep some assumptions or preconceived ideas as the britishers think the britishers think that britishers refers to christianity here try to understand the social condition of india on the basis of religion caste race and economy here becomes a systematic analysis so look at their assumption what they assume they assume they think that hinduism is filled with superstition what is good for us is superstitious for them as i have clearly mentioned or i have given the example of sati for us that is a good aspect but for them we are superstitious think about the tribal society you must have seen in tribal society there were concepts of animism and naturism people prefer to worship nature and spirit to please them they offer bali or sacrifice for the tribal that is their functional aspect or ritual aspect and that is good for their society but how will an outsider or a britisher will look at that the britisher will term it as superstitious 
that means what we call in odia as andhavishwas that means blind belief so we according to them these are all valueless aspects because they didn't have such type of aspects in their society so being an outsider they understood the society in their in their own way they tried to understand indian society in their own way. that's why the term that that hinduism is filled with superstitions and abuses secondly they assume to administer properly as i have told you first they came here for doing business later on they try to or they have started they have started ruling over us but is it possible to rule a vast country with various differences differences within it very easily of course not so they keep in in mind that as the indian society is very much differentiated or full of variations hence there is a need for categorization of various aspects as found in the society here comes your divide and rule policy here comes your divide and rule policy they introduce this policy for their benefit then who will tell, uh, who will tell them regarding this varieties it were uh, those were the anthropologists who did ethnographic studies on indian socio cultural settings so here with the advent of the britishers came a formal school of thought that is termed as an anthropological or ethnographic way of doing so, uh, study they used to study society as it is but looking at society varies but as the concept ethnography refers to the ethnographers went to a particular field for gaining details beginning from economy to the caste structure of that field so what they did they took into account three approaches to study the indian society what are those approaches the orientalist orientalist approach what is that orientalist approach that interpretation of ancient hindu text what we discussed in the ancient social structure in the first session so orientalist started to interpret the hindu vedas and shastras in the in their own way they tried to understand the hindu society which was completely guided by the ancient scriptures or texts they are termed as orientalist then comes the missionaries who are they till now you will find the missionaries what is the concept itself the missionaries are first to providing service to the needy but what type of service they were supposed to provide building from health to any aspect economy the aspect of but who are the missionaries the missionaries were basically the christians who came from britain to india with the advent of british india they tried or they thought that the indian can only be civilized if they convert the hindus into christian because hindu way of thinking is very much conservative and superstitious that is the missionary view then come another approach of studying british indian social structure is the administrative approach as i have already told you in the assumption 
they keep they kept in mind that there is a need for stratify or categorize the whole society so that they can understand it properly and they can take benefit out of it that is called their administrative approach hence i told it as the divide and rule policy and it is also mentioned in the book then let us let us discuss how they have started studying the indian society they started studying the hindu uh, indian society according to various categorization as i have already told you their administrative approach was to categorize so they started studying various aspects of the indian society first one is study of agrarian village structure why village structure it is very interesting in the next session i will discuss but keep in mind that the most of the india live in villages according to the 2001 census of india about 72% of the total population live in rural india that's why they took the first step to understand the village society and village was what was the economic background of that village the economic background of the village was agriculture agriculture and what is the social structure of the village the social structure of the village was related to any type of cultural practice with that of the cultivation or agriculture that's why they thought if they can understand the indian village properly they can understand the indian society properly so their first categorization came under the categorization of villages then came the second categorization they study the indian caste and tribes for them caste and tribe were very new aspects they were very much alienated to these aspects as they have claim as they have claim their society was class based society however they equate that class based society with the term of or the with the societal situation of varna based social status or social stratification found in indian society so they try to categorize people on the basis of their caste structure also they sub categorize the caste structure first they categorize the hindu society into four category based on varna based varna based caste system that is brahmin kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras then again they sub divided those caste categories into various sub groups most of you have an idea that as you are living in odisha as you are living in the indian indian hindu social system you must have an idea about your gotra also you must have an idea about your sub caste also for example in brahmanism there are two types of sub caste first one is called danwa those who give or do ritual activities and the second one is called as holwa those who on land and do cultivation so these are the two categories of brahmins so also with the shudras so also with the vaishyas for example talking about vaishyas you will see patras then you will see tantis so many sub categories About five thousand, more than five thousand of subcast found in Indian caste system. Who did this categorization? These Britishers. These Britishers put us in a categorized manner. That's why we call it the British way of looking at society or the British way of studying Indian society. Then come, they try to. 
promote social inquiry for establishment of formal association and institution how did as they have assumed that hindus were superstitious according to their way of thinking hindus were superstitious so how they can civilize them they can civilize them by force only they are need they are was a need to socialize them in according to their way of life their way of life means britishers way of life how they perceive and what they think rational not the hindus or the indian so they established various types of association and institutions various types of associations and institutions are the formal playground for them or they were the school to teach the modern way of thinking or the christian way of looking at the hindus so let's discuss about the establishment of formal association and institution before that helps have some idea about the indian social system that talks about caste hierarchy that talks about widowry marriage in previous before the advent of britishers there was sati pratha the widow were not allowed to get married or remarry so also caste hierarchies so also caste based status system so also difference in fooding system there are two types of food you know those are pakka food and kacha food and brahmins on accept kacha food from lower caste they will only accept pakka foods from the lower caste all this thinking what we will believe as super as a bad for our society are taught by the westerners or the britishers to us from modern education and who are the agents of modern education modern education agents were various types of associations and institutions association refers to the unity of or union of more than two person institution refers to the formal liaison of the associations for example we have an association that deal with providing selfless service to the needy but where we give it in an institutional or formalized manner we may term that that will be national scouts part of her that may be just keep in mind that western education were legalized or formalized through associations and institutions let's have some idea you must have also heard about brahma samaj movement you must have heard about telangana movement all these are the outcome of british way of thinking so to study the formal associations and the institutions various ethnographers have introduced various forms of teaching or publishing or doing social work so let's talk about the past associations and the institutions related to caste and tribes so how can we know let's discuss the main theme of study on caste and tribe 
talks about the cultural and social life of the people cultural and social life of the people it was francis buchanan who did a demographic study directed by the britishers and what he found in his findings that india is filled with or india at that moment filled with various forms of manners various forms of uh, contents and ceremonies <clears throat> similarly there was another work by william tennant he did an analysis about the domestic and rural economy of the society domestic and rural economy of the society earlier one buchanan talked about your values manners customs all those things william <clears throat> william tennant he talked about your domestic and rural economy then can herbert risley his writings are still relevant for understanding the hindu uh, for understanding the indian village or in understanding the indian society Ridgeley is best known for his ethnographic studies. He studied tribes, castes, their beliefs, sanctions, popular culture, and categorized them in his book. For example, he talked about the categorization of tribes he divided tribes into many categories on the basis of geographical structure he divided caste and claimed uh, and bring brought about the concept of dravidian and all those things that types of society or caste based society that we will discuss in caste section not here just keep in mind so why he did categorize he did categorization so that the british government could have a better knowledge about the hindu social structure after getting the ethnographic study, ethnographic output by herbert risley the britishers for the first time introduced the indian census national indian national census till now we have that census system in india the last census was 2001 and the 2011 has not yet come properly whatever may be the, but this that census if you will go through the census report you will find first a geographical categories then you will find a caste based categories then you will find religious based categories so the and then you will also find income based categorization you will also find age based categorization all those things so all those things covered under the indian census system and this indian census system for the first time was introduced by the british that's why here for uh, here you must have an idea why i turned there the, or why there was uh, the concept of divided because they categorized us so that if they can divide us then they can rule and the census helped them in doing so second aspect is promotion of social inquiry through establishment of formal association and institution first was 
the study of caste and tribe second was the promotion of social inquiry through establishment of formal association and institution what are those sir william jones sir william jones in established the first asiatic society of bengal it took into consideration the historical scientific and artistic aspect of the indian society so the asiatic society of bengal deals with three things history science and arts what and uh, what was the output of that they did categorization of subjects indology comparative philosophy comparative psychology all those things second came the society for acquisition of general knowledge society for acquisition of general knowledge what is that general knowledge most of you have been preparing for the civil service and you must have known about general knowledge general knowledge refers to having a knowledge that include all aspect of a society whether it is economic aspect whether it is ritual aspect whether it is socio cultural aspect or whether it is any type of superstitious aspect all those things so general knowledge gives you a basic idea about a society so that you can understand that society properly so the britishers having this in their mind established the society for the acquisition of general knowledge and the area of study of that society where prostitution hindu widow and female education so what were what were the areas of that society that society that talks about the prostitution problems hindu widow status female education status all those things and they informed it or they noted it properly to help the british government then come the literary society of bombay it did a statistical survey that means they started studying or accumulating quantitative data earlier there were qualitative data because they deal with the qualitative aspects philosophy indology prostitution hindu it of female education all are qualitative in nature but for the first time quantitative analysis introduced by the literary society of bombay that that did statistical survey on villages and towns to understand the social settings as found in villages and towns then can the old scientific society what we call as avad sorry the old scientific society deals with all aspects of problems as found in society that means it is more scientific than the previous institutions or associations it covers each and every aspect of the indian society which has some sorts of or had some uh, had drawbacks in it all the associations all the associations and the institutions the british has tried to control the indian society for their administrative purposes then came the third approach that is the village study approach. village study approach as i have already mentioned you according to the 2001 census 72% of the population of india lives in villages hence village study was their prime 
एम बिकॉज बिफोर बिफोर प्री बिफोर ब्रिटिशर्स इंडिया इज प्राइमरली नॉन एज द कंट्री ऑफ विलेजेस देर वेर लेस आईडी देर वेर लेस नोशन ऑफ सिटी एज ए कंसेप्ट और टाउन एज ए कंसेप्ट हाउ एवर वट मे बी दैक्ट दैट डज मैटर वट वी हैव टू कीप इन माइंड दैट द ब्रिटिशर्स ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड द सोसाइटी इंडियन सोसाइटी बाय टेकिंग इन टू टेकिंग इन टू कंसिडरेशन द विलेज as a whole so for them village can uh, the study of villages can give can give a better understanding of the indian social structure so various british ethnologists started studying villages from their point of view first it was b h baden powell he wrote a book named the land system of british india so b h baden powell at the direction of the british government started to started understanding the indian village from british point of view but as an but but as an holistic one that means whatever he will study at first sight will be as similar to the insiders view that means i am living in a village i have more knowledge about that village the social structure of the village about each and every person of that village about the social condition of the village as i am an insider if i will make a monograph on my village then i will have a better idea or the monograph will come with lots of uh, i guess so b h baden powell utilized this idea of insider to study the village but he deals with two things in his study he tried to study the social natural setting of the village in the one hand on the other hand its relation to the demand for resources that means on the one hand he tried to understand the social aspect of the village on the other hand he tried to find out how the social aspect of the village influenced the economic aspect of their villages i will give it, it more precisely in my last explanation on some case studies on villages then came henry mine who is he he did villa study in india again by the direction of the britishers he talked about the political autonomy and the economic self sufficiency of the villages he tried to understand the political system in india in the one hand and the economic system in india on the other hand and that is more specific to the villages then came the second phase of development you keep it mind just memorize in the beginning i have classified the whole sociological understanding of india into three categories the second phase here came it is between 1901 to 1950 it also talks about the britishers because after 1947 we have post independent india however categorization talks about 1901 to 1950 <coughs> so the second phase of categorization talks about indian society development of indian society that took place in between 1901 to 1950 this phase of development of indian sociology and anthropology began in 1901 for the first that means 
formalization of this strains in india because as they did formal way of doing ethnography so they introduced the formal departments of anthropology and sociology and both anthropology and sociology are one were a single department there were no difference though it is true that in delhi university you will find two things department of sociology that comes under the delhi school of economics on the other hand department of anthropology that comes under faculty of science deals with two categories of anthropology social anthropology and physical anthropology however social anthropology is very much adopted by the delhi school of economics sociology department that means delhi school of economics of uh, sociology department takes more importance or gives more importance on ethnographic studies so these all these departments can in a formalized manner why because as the britishers taught you to understand your society don't accept anything easily try to integrate if there are were any bad aspect or all the things that means they educated you in their own way which we term as modern education hence formalization of that education took place with the establishment of departments in delhi university in lucknow university in a, uh, in a kolkata university or previously it was kolkata university in bombay university and uh, iravati carve started it in that uh, dravidian karna uh, uh, sorry uh, i forgot about that uh, all the uh, departments were established dekan college iravati carve established the department of sociology in dekan college while he was studying while she was studying about the indian kinship system whatever may be let's have an idea of the chronology of establishment or formalization of the stream sociology and anthropology formalization of the stream sociology and anthropology just a minute let me check my internet uh so past had some formal ideas about the departments both subjects were taught in single department they had their roots in colonial bombay and calcutta what is that in colonial bombay and calcutta me department of anthropology and sociology took place in calcutta and bombay patrick giddies introduced the department of anthropology and civics in the university of bombay for the first time so <clears throat> gs ghure and dp mukherjee were his students of that department and they have given their own notion of studying india indian society though they were trained in western education the third phase refers to 1950 till present so during this stage after the britishers went the prime aim of our indian government or the prime aim of, aim of the independent government or prime aim of the independent in indian state was to or was to re establish india by keeping in mind development 
as the main theme. So the Congress government took development into account as their prime way of governing or rebuilding the Indian society. So they introduced the Planning Commission of India for the first time. Planning Commission of India for the first time. So who will work over there? Those ethnographers who can give for, uh, give an insider view of the society or the Indian social structure. Hence, the opportunity for more employment or education or flourishment of the stream, sociology and anthropology comes into existence. So, most of those researchers who did specific research on government policies were placed in better social status in the government sectors. So, after independence, the prime aim of the researchers or the sociologists or the anthropologists was to do research on those policies implemented by the government. But here you can see, as I mentioned, Nivas has told you, that the anthropologists were not so much interested in political aspects. Hence, the post-independent Indian social, uh, government did not give more importance to anthropology. So also, he mentioned that <coughs> the people or the Indian thinkers were skeptical of both the sciences, sociology and anthropology, because they think sociology was an, was an outcome of the Western Enlightenment. So the must uh, study Indian society from Western point of view. And the second skepticism that occurred, that, that's occurred was that the Indian thinkers thought that anthropology is an outcome of colonial legacy. Hence, both these sciences were, though have their space in the Indian, post-independent Indian scenario, yet not looked at as a science at all. Rather, they think or they accept them as a science in a suspense, uh, suspense. So now your unity three comes village study. <coughs> village study. And I have already told you the prime aim of the colonizers were to study the Indian society and categorize them into various categories so that they can hence from the very beginning in between 90 to 1950 village study gained momentum what, then what are the features of a village for the colonizers or how the colonizers perceive the notion Village. For the colonizers, village refers to self sufficient community. Self sufficient community. That means they have little interaction with other communities, other villages, or other people outside their village. Hence, Metcalf has coined the term little republics for him for matter villages were basically governed 
little communities self governed little communities who are not depending not dependent economically or socially upon other villages or other societies then comes the communal ownership of land communal refers to the way of thinking we ness communal refers to the feeling of we ness so earlier in pre british india you will find that the land is owned by the landlord they are and people used to work in uh, in the patronage of the landlords however as there is there was no provision for individual so your voice is breaking voice breaking please hold it i think the net is slow let me reconnect it just hold it sir your sound is not clear yeah yeah just Just a minute, student. I think there is a there is an internet disconnectivity. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. It is clear. Hello. Hello. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Hello. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, yeah, yeah. now is audible. Sorry for the delay. There was an internet disconnect with you. Okay. Let's discuss. Fine, sir. But yeah. this is the final so here we, that is your uh, block 1 unit 3 village study so how did as i have already told you the colonizers interpreted villages as a self sufficient community and a madcap term did as little republics self sufficiency refers to not depending upon others in any aspect and hence met cafe called it republic because the whole village is used to be governed by the people themselves republic refers uh, republic refers to governing or government for the people by the people of the people hence little republics refers to the self governed village community who rarely depend upon other communities or other villages secondly he uh, secondly the britishers take into account the land ownership or the resource or the ownership of resources and found that it is communally owned communally means it is owned by the villagers there are were no individual property so it is true that during the pre british era the whole land or property were previously held by the land owners and people used to work under their patronage and earn their livelihood then they talked about or they studied the functional integration of various occupational groups what i told you in jajmani system that studied that they found 
village is very much governed by the jajmani system all caste had in, uh, all caste were interrelated or dependent upon each other fourthly they found that the village people were very simple there is less individualism rather the feeling of oneness that predominates their life <clears throat> so what we will find or what we will study if we will visit a village <clears throat> if you will visit a village as the britishers have already mentioned you will find that those villages represent the majority demographical structure of the indian society majority demographical structure of the indian society demography means study of population that means if you will make an entry to the village we can find the real india lives in villages so the village at the first side refers to a demographical structure secondly by entering to the village we will find an ideological category what is that category ideological category we will see the way of purity pollution the way of fooding the way of housing all those things so <clears throat> part after pre after uh, uh, so what the post independent india tries to do with the village it tries to rebuild the village that has the backwardness or stagnant agrarian economy however for doing that that took help from the previously written ethnography ethnographs by the british government as i have from as i have already mentioned from the very beginning that the idea of in studying sociology in india or studying anthropology in india is very much influenced by the western so studying the present scenario of villages the government of india through pal through planning commission and through the researchers try to rebuild the economic agrarian structure of the indian society uh, and the previous ethnographs help them a lot how did they do field work this section deals with the methodology of doing village study there are something that you need to keep in mind book view and field visit book view and field visit you just mean <clears throat> memorize or recall that from the very beginning i have told them you that to understand indian society earlier we had to understand the ancient scriptures that understanding of the previous books ethnographs scriptures all these refers to book view and what is the field work field work refers to accepting the ideas from the books and applying them in the field to study the present scenario of the villages that is called as your field work then what is the method they utilize to do field work as i have already told you ethnography refers to participant observation that means you have to study the society from within that is called as your participant observation hence they are of course the notion of participant observation basically from the ideas of malnoski radcliffe brown wh r rivers uh, then durkheim all of them 
even the marxist also do field work field work gives them an idea whether to accept the text or whether or to interrogate the text hence to understand properly or holistic understanding of the village needs to be done through taking consideration of the texts and doing field work at the same time for test knowledge <clears throat> so what you will find in ethnographies the uh, done by the british british anthropologist or sociologist or the indian anthropologist or sociologist if you will look into their ethnographies you can find the various characteristics of villages how can we tell or how can we know what is a village all about to know that if you will look at the characteristics of those villages then we can claim that that is a village and not a town so the first characteristics of a village lies with horizontal ties horizontal ties means that is in a row just keep in mind just recall you have to draw a 90 degree drawing in geometry the ground the axis refers to your horizontal and the 90 degree upward uh, line refers to your vertical so horizontal tie refers to the relationship between caste groups that means what i had already told you about the jajamani system that is your horizontal tie then what is the vertical ties vertical ties refers to the relationship between caste hierarchies what type of hierarchy in horizontal there is also caste um, uh, relations between different caste but in vertical you will find the concept of sanskritizers while doing his field work among the kurks of mysore Mn Srinivas introduced the concept of Sanskritization. What is Sanskritization? Sanskritization refers to following up the ritual and the lifestyle of the upper caste to claim equal status with them. That is called your Sanskritization. That Sanskritization concept refers to the idea of vertical ties you must have idea about your village you must have heard about a caste called vaisnava the vaisnavas claim equal status to that of a brahmin how did they claim or how do they claim by practicing the equal ritual habits a brahmin does they ought take pacha food they usually eat cooked food with ghee they don't take garlic they don't take onions and the claim a status unique status that is equivalent to the brahminical status hence such type of claiming status is called your vertical ties then comes your identity your village gives you a we feel i am from this village you are from that village all those things i my village is best his village is yours some sort of ethnocentrism comes to our mind while we talk about the identity of our uh, identity characteristics or identity formation within a village you will find that if a if an outsider attacks any member of the village the whole village comes to protect him and has the outside that refers to the feeling that attacking or suppressing one member of my village is equal to the suppressing or attacking of the total village this is your identity 
that gives you identity. I am a, I am from this village or that village. In the national level, you have the identity that we, the people of India, we claim ourselves as India. In village level, various villages claim themselves, villagers claim themselves, they belong to that village. So only identity does not refer to this witness. Also, there are some sorts of identity occurs based on caste also. The dominant caste in a village reflected the identity of that village. If Brahmins dominate in a village, that means that a village will be termed as Brahminical village. If that village is dominated by the colonels or the Khatriyas, then that village will be known as Khatriya village. Just have an idea about Puri. The Puri town is very much linked to the socio-cultural settings of the Jagannath culture. There you will find various sahis, that means certain professional best, caste best village categories who contribute equally for the Jagannath culture. However, each Sahi has its unique identity. Then comes your reciprocity. Reciprocity refers to the relationship that occurs on the basis of give and take. Give and take. Or more properly, you can use the term interdependence. <laughs> then comes the coercive aspect of caste relation. What is caste? As I have already told you, caste is a segmental hierarchical division of the society that places people in a hierarchical order. So, this is the negative aspect of caste in this sound of Western education. Because the caste system divided the, uh, the whole village system into certain categories. The categories as that talks about is very much related to caste endogamy. Caste endogamy means getting married outside the caste is prohibited. So also another type of uh, constraint occurs with that to the village identity too. Inside a village, no one can marry, but anyone who wishes to marry outside the village is allowed, but marrying inside the village is not allowed. That is called as village exogamy. While studying the kinship system, I will tell you all those things. Then the last characteristics of the Indian village refers to gender differences. It is very much important. Gender refers to a social construction. What do we see as boy or girl refers to the sexual <clears throat> differences, but gender refers to the status attached on the basis of success. That means male or female. And now there is another gender called the third sex or the inuit or the transgender. You will find in villages, till now, in villages, there is a stereotypical notion that the females needs to be confined within the household activities. So how they identify the female? They identify the female with household activities as well as with the kinship relations. That means my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, all the all of them needs to be working within the home itself, not outside. And who are the males? Those males, male refers to the and other part of gender who usually claim a superior position to the females. And they did 
outside activities or more probably you can call them as men so let's have some works on villagers as i have already told you bd hadens powell's village study in the previous section let's talk about lewis lewis uh, study oscar lewis study he analyzed the villager on the basis of housing problems educational problems health problems land consideration problems and government acquired or <clears throat> government sponsored panchayat system why he dealt with all these problems because he was working with the four foundation which work for the community development of the society or community development in indian society so he did his study to give him resource full of data to the people yeah is there any problem okay then comes sc dubey's interpretation of villages he interpreted or categorized the village on the basis of borno based caste system hence as i have already told you he categorized the whole population all the whole demography of the village into brahmins kshatriyas vaishyas sutras and untouchables he didn't accept the earlier categorization of caste that deals with only four the brahmins kshatriyas vaishyas and sutras he claimed that the untouchables too have been particular or important role during the freedom struggle hence they should not be decasted and then comes the classification of village status he struck uh, status in a village is determined by the following six class categories first religion and caste as i have already told you a brahmin village or khatriya village or something like that then count the status within the village on the basis of land ownership those who have land they will enjoy the higher status even you will find comparison between a brahmin village and a jat village a brahmin village and a khatriya village all those things on the basis of land ownership those caste who have the land and are majority their village will be identified or their people will enjoy the status accordingly then comes the position in government service and village organization you must have heard about a village named sakhi gopal in puri sakhi gopal is famous for giving more odisha administrative servant and central administrative servant that village is full of filled with ips os and ias hence when you will find a village that is very much famous suddenly sakhi gopal come to your mind that this is the village with highest number of prestigious government servants so this government service gives a specific status to that village also age is another factor the village which has more younger population is richer than that a village which has less younger population or working class population then comes your personality traits that i have told about in sanskrit as that means earlier a village 
was dominated by the sudras or by the vaisyas but suddenly it claimed itself to be a <coughs> dominated by <coughs> rich uh, character like vaisnavaic villages that means they started following the upper caste to claim a upper stratification uh, upper status and accordingly the status of the village varies thank you if you have any doubt you can ask me any doubt hello uh, hello subrat yes sir one is one next so do you have any doubt please clarify anybody anybody wants to any question mujhe ko nani patthar ko do matlab hai please be little louder anybody have any question students Sir, uh, <clears throat> there is a need a clarification. So uh, in the slide of socio-anthropological picture of villages, there is a mention of vertical ties and reciprocity. And horizontal ties. Yes, there is a mention of uh, vertical ties and another is reciprocity. And reciprocity. So how do we yes. differentiate? You want to know the difference yes, between yes, vertical ties and reciprocity? Yes. Okay. Is there any concept of vertical? Yeah, yeah. Ah, sir. Sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. Explain. Ah, ah. Just recall. Go to go to the section. If you are writing there, then just go to the section. I have talked about horizontal tie. Have you seen that? Yes. More exploratory aspect of the project of the tie, it's called as reciprocal relation. Okay. Why I have mentioned that in that manner? Because you you will when you will go through the slides, you will find that I have mentioned the thinkers' name or the social workers or the anthropologists' name. How they categorize the classification? Are you getting it? There is a very similar similarity between horizontal tie and reciprocity, but vertical tie refers to the idea of sanspitizers. The vertical the vertical tie can be a Warner system, and the Warner system called be a vertical tie. See, see, you are right. Warner system. and go to dubey concept of varna system dubey argued that caste is nothing but this sub group of a varna system hence vertical tie is not outside of varna system are you getting it yes sir yeah so uh, uh, my diet was in the in the reciprocity also there is a interdependence between caste and yes. in also Uh, in other vertical ties also there is a interdependence or interrelation so is there any difference between reciprocity and vertical ties the only difference is that try to get me properly the only difference is that interdependence refers to i am helping you and you are in return helping me okay that means if i will serve you you need to serve me If I am a Brahmin, I went to your home and worship. In return, if you are a uh, weaver, then you will provide me with uh, with the clothes and all those things. But in vertical ties, vertical ties means giving another type of identity that you follow my way of rituals. Okay, how I maintain my daily passage of life. That means what is my way of doing ritual activity. what is my way of uh, fooding what is my way of uh, clothing and if you are following me uh, to claim that you are not of a lower caste and you follow me properly then i will develop a relationship with you that though it is not equal but somehow equal that is called your vertical tie that means the relationship between a vaisnavite and a brahmin it comes under this vertical tie
get it yes sir are still there uh -huh. yes sir are you clear or not clear what half yeah yeah tell me tell me don't hesitate to ask question just tell me i will try to make it as simple as possible sir uh, my doubt was uh -huh. in vertical ties also there is relationship between the caste hierarchy that means caste hierarchy yes. here here as i have written it in point manner hence mentioned that relationship between caste hierarchies but while teaching you i explained it what type of relation that relation based on the aspect of sanskritization vertical means going above the caste status position you are a sudra but you are claiming the position of a vaishnavite or a brahmin if you will follow the social way of living of the brahmin and when the brahmin thinks that you are maintaining hygiene you are having that uh, practice a like mind uh, caste then similarly there will be a good bonding in between us okay you you can mark it very well just like brahmins the boys boysnobites on take food in your other's house they maintain very much purity and pious so generally people as the boysnobites as a part of the uh, brahmin culture not brahmin but brahmin culture that type of type is called vertical cultural type vertical that means detachment is the relationship yes, they are in the caste hierarchy yeah yeah that means detachment is the relationship is related or, or separation is the relationship which one in vertical ties the uh, get that it? means differences between yeah. the different castes or the detachment between the different castes is the relationship that is the relationship in vertical ties yeah. there is differences still you claim some type of relation you try to analyze yourself that i am also equal to the brahmins or the higher caste you try to get an identity of yourself creating an identity of yourself that is your vertical type if when you will go through the book it is not mentioned here while in the uh, section of caste in the in your second module we will talk about this more clear fine sir thank you okay any any other questions okay subro sir thank you very much so <laughs> I, i i must thanks to you for your presentation so might be our learners interest in uriya also so you can both mix the both the language english okay. and uriya okay so might be our student will more okay. comfortable will you make, make it 70 30 70% okay, okay. english and 30% english or 60 40 okay Okay, so okay. that that will come okay. uh, yes, okay. it's all right learners so according to that next class you take your next class is on i mean 9th okay so learners okay. tomorrow is your mso 3 paper so okay anyway thank you once again to subro sir so uh, today's session i conclude once again i thank you sir thank you and sir thank you know what the presentation the presentation slides you put it in the whatsapp group yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will watch a bit too. Now I am making that. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome.